everyone, and welcome to the Passport to Peru lecture series. My name is Kiernan, and I'll be your host on behalf of Peru for Less and Inca Expert Travel. Today's lecture is focused on the artisan traditions of the Sacred Valley with our expert, Kennedy Levins. I personally would like to thank everyone for tuning in today on both Zoom and Facebook Live. We're so glad you could join us. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Kennedy will be answering some questions from the audience after her lecture, so please feel free to feel free to submit questions to her at any time during the presentation. For those on Zoom, you can just enter in your questions into the Zoom Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom browser. And for those on Facebook Live, just enter into your questions into the comment section of the live stream. We are so pleased to welcome Kennedy Levins, the founder and director of Aomaki, a nonprofit in Peru working to connect Andean women artisans with the modern economy through their ancestral crafts. Today, Kennedy will be discussing life in Quechua villages, how Aomaki is empowering women artisans and the role their rich textile traditions play in both Quechua culture and the economy. Peru captured Kennedy's imagination on a school trip in 2001. She went on to study economy, economic development in Latin America at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and moved to Peru after graduation. There she, found, uh, there she founded Aomaki and lived in Peru for almost eight years. Uh, during that time, she earned her master's in public administration, specializing in nonprofit management from the University of Washington in Seattle. She now lives in Seattle full time, travels to Peru regularly, and dreams of moving her family back there someday. Hi, Kennedy. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad to have you. Hi, Kiernan. Thank you. I always love talking about Peru. So, anytime. <laughs> Same. <laughs> I agree. It's really nice that we have these series and we can, can talk about it, even though people can't really do too much traveling right now. Um, before we get started, I was hoping that you could tell our audience about what first brought you to Peru and what made you want to stay. Yeah, what first brought me to Peru was a school trip when I was 17, which was um, 20 years ago this summer, um, which is hard to believe. I traveled with a group of classmates and a teacher whose sister had moved to Peru in the 1980s and um, just just fell in love with Peru. And as far as what the second part, which is what, what brought me back, I think, mm -hmm. um, was that I just kind of couldn't really think of anything else that I was that I wanted to do as much. Um, it was, uh, you know, it just kind of Peru has a way of working its way into your heart, and that happened to me. And um, and I never really seriously considered doing anything else. That's amazing. I completely agree. I've been here for five years, and I can't really see myself leaving anytime soon. Well, before I pass the mic over to you, I would like to remind the audience that they can submit questions at any time during the presentation, either through the Q&A um, feature on Zoom or the Facebook live stream comment section. Thanks so much, everyone, and enjoy the lecture. And thanks again, Kennedy. Yeah. All right. So now I'm going to share my screen. Right. Here we go. And I'm going to put it on presentation mode. There, how does that look to everybody? Okay, hopefully okay. Um, okay, so uh, so my name is Kennedy um, and I am the founder and executive director of an organization called Awamaki. Um, and that Awamaki is a nonprofit. We work in rural Peru um, in the rural Andes near the town of Oyante Tambo. And I don't know if most of you have been to Peru and already love it or just want to come. Um, but Oyante Tambo is in the heart of the Sacred Valley and is really the jumping off point to Machu Picchu. It's where the train to Machu Picchu leads from. And so Oyante Tambo gets a lot of tourism, but in the surrounding mountainside, just you know, a half an hour or an hour's drive, there are rural Quechua villages um, that uh, where until really until very recently life has remained the same for, for hundreds of years. Um, and uh, and these are the villages where our monkey works. Um, so, uh, so this is Oyante Tambo. Um, uh, you can see uh, um, a lot of tourist buses and people on the square. That is not what it looks like now, but um, all of these pictures are from before COVID. Um, and this is one of the rural villages where we work. Um, so these villages are located at very high altitude. Oyanta is at 9,000 feet, um, and the villages are anywhere from 10 to 14,000 feet of altitude. Um, it's very cold, and it um, not a lot grows there, just potatoes and other tubers. Um, and in some of the villages, depending on the altitude, maybe quinoa, 
or maybe corn, uh, fava beans, um, but, but not a ton. Um, the villages were mostly settled by people who were fleeing the conquest hundreds of years ago. Um, one question we get is, why did people live up here? And it's because they were, they were trying to get really far away from what was happening in Kiko. Um, and because of that uh, cultural legacy, um, the villages are really intentionally and have been intentionally very isolated for centuries um, and, and are very wary of outsiders, um, which creates kind of an interesting dynamic with tourism. Um, but uh, this is also why the Quechua traditions in the villages like weaving and farming um, and, and other crafts remain really strong. Um, this is the path to one of the villages that we work with. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the more remote villages um, and, uh, and some of the alpaca that, um, that roam high above the villages. Um, and this is Graciela. She is one of our, uh, one of the weavers that we work with. Um, she is now about 30, um, growing up. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Graciela's, Graciela's family just to illustrate some of the changes in the villages over, over the past, you know, generation or two. Um, growing up, Graciela was the youngest of five children. Um, and she has an older sister, Berta, who is about 10 years older than her. Um, they are from a village called Paracancha. Um, this is the first village that our monkey started working with, and it's a place that um, that I've spent a lot of time and is very close to my heart and a, it's spectacularly beautiful, beautiful place. So um, so in Paracancha, while Graciela's older sister Berta was growing up, um, families relied on subsistence agriculture and on the barter economy. Villagers mostly spoke Quechua, which is still true, um, and only some of the men spoke Spanish. Um, even now, women over the age of about 25 don't speak Spanish. Um, and we can, you know, we'll go into why and what the dynamics there are. But um, uh, this is, these are just some scenes of rural life from the villages. Um, when Berta was growing up, there were no stores. There was no phone service. Um, there was one community phone that had a solar panel. Um, so did not work when it was cloudy. Um, we. <laughs> There are still villages that rely on this phone and we uh, very recently, some of them have gotten cell service, but, but for most of our monkey's existence, we've relied on radio to, to get messages to the artisans. So we will you know, pay one or two soles and put an announcement on the local radio station. Um, and the broadcaster will say, you know, Awamaki's coming with tourists on Thursday at 9 a.m. <laughs> um, and that's how we, how we um, communicate with the artisans and, and have communicated with the artisans for most of the time that we've been working, although that's starting to change a little bit. Um, so Berta did not go to school past the third grade because school only went until third grade until 1998 um, in Paracancha. They put a high school in, in the year 2001. So girls Graciela's age were able to attend high school. Um, Berta and Graciela's mother, Asunta, did not go to school at all. Um, so you can see some of the generational changes happening just in this in this one family. Um, here's another scene of a, a nearby village called Weak Alto. Um, you can see the agricultural terraces here. Um, this really makes me want to go back. This is Asunta. Um, uh, she is a master weaver. This is the skill that she taught her daughters. Um, weaving is how she kept her family clothed and warm in the harsh Andean environment, um, just like her mother did, just like her grandmother did. Um, weavings were also economically important um, because when Asunto was growing up, because they were used in the barter economy, which was the main economy. Um, subsistence agriculture and barter were the main kind of economic forces um, in the villages until really recently. So, um, uh, and that was just until maybe a few decades ago that weavings could be used as barter. So um, when Asunta was growing up and when her kids were young, there were no roads to the village, to, to Paracancha where she, where she lived. And so she had to walk four hours in order to reach the nearest markets, which were in Oyate Tambo, which is why the barter economy was important because they didn't have stores. Um, 
roads were built to Padakansha and Weok and Kilganka and the other villages in the in the um, valley between 10 and 30 years ago, Kalukanka, the furthest community, um, you still have to walk at the end. <laughs> the, the road doesn't quite make it all the way there. So these changes are in progress. Um, so as is really typical in villages like Padakansha um, and all over kind of remote communities in rural Peru, um, Asunta's husband, Lucario, worked as a porter on the Inca Trail um, and then later as a mule driver for tourist trekking. So he um, and, and most of the men in the village were often gone for, um, for weeks at a time and, and left the women really to maintain the homes and take care of the children and take care of the farm and, and really kind of preserve and carry out the culture as well. And this is, you see this all over the world that women are in charge of, of cultural preservation. And so, um, you know, so so the women are living in the communities, and there there aren't really economic opportunities in these communities, especially you know, twenty or thirty years ago. Um, there's not really a way to. I mean, there's farming, which is an economic activity, but there's not really a way to earn money. Um, uh, even though Asunta and other women like her are astoundingly talented in fiber arts, um, they keep sheep and alpaca. They shear them. That's something that the men help with also. Um, and then they will spin the wool into fleece uh, or the fleece into, into yarn on the drop spindle, um, dye it using natural dyes or chemical dyes, depending on what they're using it for. Um, and, uh, and then they will use blankets or clothing, um, things for their home. Um, but this wasn't, uh, they didn't really have a way to access markets for this. Um, so here are some, just a little bit about the the weaving process, the artisan um, traditions. So this is, uh, a, a, she's been, and actually, I think Asunta has a, a, a spindle. Um, I'm not sure, let's see, this says pointer, sorry. Oh, look, okay, so here we have a pointer. Um, so so you can see the, the drop spindle there um, that Asunta has, and she is spinning, um, she's spinning from yarn into, into like two ply yarn. And then this artisan is spinning from the raw fleece into, um, into the first ply of yarn. So the yarn is actually spun many times, um, sometimes three or four times in order to make it um, two ply or three ply and get it as smooth and as thin and as strong as they want it um, and need it for weaving on the backstrap loom, which is hard on yarn. It's a lot of hugging and, and taut, the tautness is really important. Um, there's another image of the, the drop spindle. Um, this artisan is weaving and spinning at the same time. This is a tour. They don't normally weave and spin at the same time. <laughs> um, but you can see she has the, um, let's see, where's my pointer? Um, oh, it's still here. Um, okay, so you can see she has the, the, uh, the backstrap loom set up. She's just weaving a, a kind of a thin bracelet. Um, and then here is some of the yarn that's naturally dyed um, with some of the dye plants and two, two Busca spindles. Here's one and here's the other. These are brown and white. So that's just the color of the animal. Um, and then they will take the white and they'll dye that. And then most of the browns and grays and blacks that you see in the weavings are actually just the color of the wool and undyed. Um, and so they're using the different natural dyes to create these different colors. You can see that the naturally dyed wool is very beautifully laid on top of um, weavings that are dyed with synthetic dyes, um, which is an interesting, that's something that they use for themselves. And then the natural dyes are usually things that they sell to tourists. Um, and then uh, let's see, and then here's the backstrap loom. Um, this is one of the designs that we've worked with artisans to develop, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but this is not the tradition you can see here. I hope I'm not going back and forth too much for people, but you can see here, this is really the, the, the yikya that these dye, that these yarns are on, and that's the word for the kind of weaving that this is, are, um, are very typical of the designs in this village. And um, here you can see that the the, uh, here it is. The, um, 
the weaving is is a different style. And so that's something that we've worked with the artisans to develop, but I, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then here's another close up of the process. Um, she's using a tool to pick up the each individual strand and just and uh, determine which color shows on the front of the weaving. Um, and that's called a process is called Tayai. Um, that's what she's doing here with this. Uh, in this picture, um, here's another, you can see the backstrap loom uh, here a little bit better and you can see the woven weaving is all rolled up, um, which is what they do. Uh, and that makes the backstrap loom totally portable. She can stake this out and unroll it anywhere um, and just carry the backstrap loom and the unfinished weaving with her, which is pretty cool. Um, here's another an, an underside of the the weaving here. Um, um, so I'm gonna go back to the weaving here. Um, so despite you know being immensely skilled, uh, for many years the women of Patagonia and other communities like it um, really didn't have a good way to sell their weavings. So if they needed money, this was one of the few options that they had was to sell their weavings, but you know, they don't speak Spanish. They have never been to school. They um, have, you know, aren't, don't read and write. Um, and so, and don't really, you know, participate in a market economy very much. Um, and so they, uh, you know, if they needed money, sometimes the middlemen would come to the villages and buy weavings at a really low price. And then sometimes they, you know, if you really needed money for something specific and nobody was showing up at your door, you would walk to town and go door to door at the tourist shop, and um, and uh, and basically try to sell your your weaving to someone who would resell it. And this was not, um, you know, they were not able to gain a higher price for for their work, even though it's incredibly high quality and very time consuming. And so, um, and so now I'm going to talk about Alamaki because that's kind of why we why we exist. Um, and this is one of the reasons that we started. Um, so in, in 2007, I moved to Peru. Um, I was just out of college to volunteer with a local organization that was working with artisans, women to, um, and this, this organization was a museum. And so their goal was really cultural preservation. So they were working with young women from the villages to, um, to find them a market for their weaving so that they would keep weaving because at the time, you know, they weren't able to barter their weavings. They weren't able to, you know, get cash for their weavings. They were buying, increasingly buying clothes instead of making them. And, um, and so a lot of women, especially young women, weren't weaving anymore. So that's why this project existed. Um, and uh, that project folded, which is, you know, a Zoom call for another, for another day. <laughs> um, but, uh, but my coworkers and the artisans and I from that project um, founded Alamaki to keep doing what we were doing and also with an emphasis on income creation for the artisans and business development. Um, also cultural preservation, but you know, we weren't, we weren't a museum. We were about artisan, artisan empowerment and, and women earning income. And that's still, you know, um, I would say both of those, th those, those goals are often united for us and sometimes intention for us, which is, um, which has been interesting to, to navigate. So, um, uh, so, uh, so now at Alamaki, we really focus on market access for indigenous women um, through fair trade, fair trade craft sales. So through the sales of the weavings, um, but also through sustainable tourism has become a big part of what we do as tourism in the area has grown. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit more again about Graciela. Um, and, uh, oops. Yeah, here we go. Um, so this is Graciela and her son, Ronald. Um, Graciela is 13 in this picture and her son is one. And um, she's one of the weavers that we have worked with from the very beginning. When we started, we had 10 weavers. Now we work with, um, well, before the pandemic, we were working with over 200. Now we're at about 180. Um, but uh, I met Graciela, you know, when I was first working in Peru before Alamaki even started. And this is when this picture was taken. Um, this having a child this young is not common in the villages. Her parents were really upset. This was not a norm, it's not unheard of, but it's not, you know, it's not endemic. Um, 
Graciela had dropped out of school to take care of her son and she and um, the uh, baby's dad were living with her parents. He was attending high school, which starts at like 13 or 14 in Peru. So they were about the same age. Um, and uh, uh, and she had learned to weave from her mother and she's you know, like Asunta is a fabulous weaver. Um, so she joined our project and she wove with Alamaki to earn money to put her, to support her son while her husband studied um, and to put him through high school. Um, she was also part of our sustainable tourism program when it first started, we, um, we sent our first tourists to, to visit her and her family. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our sustainable tourism program, which is um, the connection with, um, with Passport to Peru here. So, um, so one of the things that we saw when we were in the villages so much was, uh, and, and also you know talking to the artisans and hearing their experience um, was that the tourism as it was to the villages was really, could be really disruptive. And so, um, you know, the tourists usually came unannounced. They, uh, you know, the artisans didn't know when they were coming. It's really difficult to communicate with the communities. And, um, and, uh, and so we worked with the artisans to develop a program that would, uh, that would make tourism a more beneficial force that they had more control over and more say in how it went. Um, so one of the things that we um, did with them was, you know, we made a schedule. So we made sure that they knew in advance that the visitors were coming. Um, we worked with them to create like a safe physical space for the tour to happen um, where photography was, um, was okay. What, where, you know, where the, where the tourism part could happen. So you didn't have tourists wandering through the villages, through the communities and kind of wandering uninvited into people's homes or, accidentally or you know taking photos without asking which um was that was another big issue visiting the school um often guides would bring tourists to schools which is thankfully now people kind of realize that's not really okay okay to do Tour schools aren't really you know i'd be furious if a group of tourists showed up at my kid's school and then they let out the school and um but that was happening pretty regularly um and so uh so then and and so we, we worked to address kind of some of these community norms for tourists. And then we also created a schedule with the artisans that they manage that's a rotation um, to ensure that even people who live really far from the tourist center can participate in tourism. Um, we uh, made sure that they are compensated for their time, um, even if they don't sell a weaving, which wasn't the case previously. Um, you know, if a tour group showed up, everyone would just kind of drop everything they were doing and come and try to sell them a weaving. And if you didn't sell a weaving, then you were just kind of out of luck for that couple hours of your day. Um, and we did a lot of training about how to host tourists. So when, for example, when the, and this is one of our artisans with the, her, the, the part of their home that they had made specifically for tourism. Um, and when they started, uh, you know, when we started placing tourists in their homes, they would, you know, they would make like a meal and they would, the family would like put the tourists in like a dining room or a kitchen by themselves and make in a different room, like a plate of like fried chicken and French fries or something totally not typical for the community and give this to them like by themselves in this cold room, <laughs> you know, which is like not why the tourists were there. Um, and so talking to them, but to them it's like these well this is obviously what foreigners eat is fried chicken and french fries and this is also the most special and delicious food we can think of like this is a real treat for us so we definitely want to serve this to our visitors and so we you know we ended up doing a lot of training around why why they're there and what you know what they want from what what visitors want from this experience and um you know and now you can see there's like this this part of the house is is just totally typical, right? It's adobe, it's thatch roof, it has weavings within it, um, right? And so this is, you know, really emphasizing the traditional parts of the of community life and, um, and the family connection as well. Um, so through this kind of collaboration and training and listening and working with the artisans, um, we together with them built the number one trip on tour, or tour on trip advisor for Oriente Tambo. Um, and we won in 2018 and 2019, we won 
few major international tourism sustainability awards, which was wonderful. Um, our artisan partners who participated in tourism were making more than their husbands, which was also awesome. Um, we were seeing some of the husbands scale back their work outside the village so that they could support their wives. Um, none of that is happening right now. And we can talk more about that in Q&A if you guys want, but, um, but it was wonderful and we're, and we're gonna keep doing it as soon as we can. Um, oh, here, I've forgotten to slide through some of the tourism photos. So um, this is on one of the tours. Um, this is a, after a traditional apachamanco, which is where you uh, cook traditional food underground. Um, and uh, um, and yeah, and I'm gonna, and this is a really early, a really early photo um, from, from Awamaki, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about our, um, our artisan product and fair trade, fair trade side of what we do. So um, we bring kind of a similar ethos of um, collaboration and market access and trainings to our work in, um, in crafts with them. And this is really where we started. You know, we started with a store selling, selling weaving to tourists. Um, and this is still remains kind of the heart of, of Awamaki and what we do. Um, the, uh, we, you know, we, we try to take your, you know, collaboration with the artisans and respect for their traditional designs with contemporary market knowledge and product development. Um, so because we learned pretty early on that we can sell a lot more and they can sell a lot more if, um, if we take the weavings and we put them on like a bag or something instead of just selling this weaving that you see here. Um, even though it's really beautiful, a lot of people don't know how they would use that in their house in the US. Um, although I have lots of ideas for you if you, if you want one. <laughs> um, just to talk a little bit about some of the designs in the weavings, I alluded to this earlier, but you can see I've created some arrows on here because I didn't realize I would have a pointer um, but, uh, you know, here is, uh, um, up here you have, this is a, um, the Viscacha. So this is like kind of like a, ro a very large rodent like animal. Um, this is a condor that you see here. Um, this is Inti, the sun, um, you know, the sun god in, uh, in sort of Quechua animism. Um, this is a Tika, which is a flower, but it's also a wheel of life. So the six pieces of this, um, of this design of this flower, the six petals of it represent a different um, staple food. So you have three different tubers, um, uh, potato and oka and uh, lisa, and then you have um, quinoa and amaranth and aba bean. Um, this is a kocha, a lake. Uh, and so, uh, so you can see this, these designs are incredibly intricate uh, and anamorphic. So this is really unusual um, in the valley where we work. Most places just have GF, are distinct designs in every valley, in every community. But um, but the ones where we work are are actually, you know, they'll they'll do historical figures or a house or a Peruvian flag, all kinds of things. And so um, you can see really specific animals, like there's birds and there's all different kinds of birds. Um, you know, and they're really representing specific bird species in, in the weavings. Uh, there's actually a fox in here. Um, yeah, and so, uh, so incredibly intricate, very time consuming. Um, I see a lot of questions popping up, but I think we were going to save those for afterwards. I love talking about weaving designs. So you could just, and before, you know, Quechua, the Inca were the most advanced civilization to not have a written language. And their written language really was weaving. Like you could, you can tell stories, you can pass down histories, you can express your ideas and, um, and, and skilled weavers are doing this. They're doing this less now with tourists because this, you know, this level of design um, doesn't fetch three times the price of a weaving that's a third of the work, but, um, but they are still doing this, this stuff, which is um, important. Um, anyways, and then this is, this is the kind of thing that we do. Um, so these are some of our products that we're making with them. Um, so they're still, the, the weaving you saw on the previous slide, they're selling those on tours to tourists. Um, here in the U.S. to retailers, we sell, um, we sell these items. So these still have a really strong Andean design story, but um, are adapted for a more contemporary market. 
Um, so for example, like this, um, this bag, this tote bag, this is um, based on a, a, a design called Cuatro Estacas, which represents the four corners of the Inca empire and is typically used as a sacred offering cloth and is actually instead of a weaving uh, a loom with two sides, it actually is a loom with four sides. It's incredibly complex and difficult to do. And only one of our partner villages knows how to do it. Um, and uh, and we've just taken that, uh, we've just taken this, this center cross and we put it a little bit off center, which is the only design difference that we've made. Um, from from what they typically do, and so a lot, you know, a lot of the, the the products that we're selling still have are deeply rooted in Indian design. We've just worked with the artisans to adapt to adapt them um, so that so that they can so they can earn more money, which is uh, great. <laughs> um, let me see. I keep checking my watch because I don't want to go over. Um, okay, so um, uh, yeah, so uh, so. So back to Awamaki and what we do, a really big, so I, I'm talking about selling products. We, and you know, we sell tours too. Um, our model is really social enterprise based. And so a huge part of our revenue comes from earned income or, you know, did before the pandemic when we ran tours and sold crafts to tourists and everything was really great. <laughs> um, and uh, and um, so about 70 or 80% of our income comes from those programs and those programs generate income for us to cover our operating costs and they also generate income for the artisans to serve our mission. Um, we are a nonprofit and we use donations and grants to do business trainings and skills building with the artisans. Um, and so this is one of our trainings. Um, we do a lot of training in product quality, in hosting tourists, like I mentioned, um, in weaving, you know, technical skill improvement, weaving, you know, in order to make a bag like in the previous slide, you really need to weave it the right measurement, right? Because the bags all have to come the same size when order somebody orders like six of them. Um, and, you know, and so there's a lot of skills development that goes into that because typically when you're just weaving clothes for your family, they don't all have to be the same size. Uh, nobody's like measuring them. And if you have never been to school, like measuring everything, I mean, yeah, and so it's just, um, it's been uh, an incredible process with them, you know, working with them to get weavings high enough quality that we can export. Um, uh, so that's a lot, you know, that's a lot of what donor funds for us funded in the past um, and business development. So our goal is actually, we don't work with individual artisans. We only work with groups. Um, and our goal is really um, not to be, their only customer. So we work with groups that are motivated and excited about, um, about building an artisan's business. And so part of our program, of course, is income generation um, and, and the artisans having a way to earn money, but we also want them through our program to learn how to run a business and connect with customers that aren't us. And so we also sometimes even connect them directly uh, directly to other customers so that they can, you know, they can build that business and graduate ultimately from our training model because we don't want to just train you forever, right? Like um, we want you to graduate and be a successful business that we can buy from, that other people can buy from, and that clears up space in our program so we can bring in new artisans um, to also train. So, uh, so this is one of the trainings. Um, you can see they are, a lot of what we do is like women's rights and the place of women and thinking about the place of women and like leadership kind of training. Um, this is their drawing six figures on here. It could be probably like a, you know, drawing a self portrait or something. Um, and then here, I can't see what they're doing here, but this is another photo from one of our trainings. All before the pandemic, of course, we do not run trainings during pandemic. Um, and, uh, and now I'm gonna talk just a little bit about um, the changes in the villages that we've seen. So, um, you know, the shifts in the role of weaving that I'm talking about are really part of larger shifts in the villages. Um, so, you know, the road I think was the start of that. Um, and, uh, and, and there's, you know, and the school being built. When I moved to Peru in 2007, almost none of the women spoke Spanish because they hadn't been young enough to attend the schools that were open by then. Um, but, and, and a lot of them who were old enough didn't attend um, because 
other things seemed more important. Um, and so now, you know, most of our younger women partners have attended school. They do speak Spanish. Um, but with that, they were also seeing, you know, seeing other changes that come with modernization. So a family makes a lot of money from tourism. And what do they do? They invest in their house, which is awesome. And they take off the thatch roof and they put on a tin roof or a tile roof, or they build a new room and they build it with concrete blocks and not with adobe or stone, which is typical um, and a lot more work and doesn't last as long, right? Um, and so uh, they, you know, they decide to buy clothes instead of weaving them. Um, and, and even since I first moved to Peru, which was, I guess, like 13 or 14 years ago now, you see a lot fewer people in traditional, in traditional clothing. Um, families also save up and send their children to school after high school, which was basically unheard of when I moved to Peru. Um, and a lot of people in, out from outside the village really mourn a lot of these changes, especially some of the more aesthetic ones, like people, people's dress and people's homes. Um, most people in the villages do not mourn these changes, although some of them do. I would not say, I mean, it's not just like any group, it's not a monolith, right? And so you, there, and there's definitely conversations about, you know, what the future looks like um, for the cultural culture in these communities. Um, um, the belief that guides us as we navigate this um, at Awamaki is really our belief that income in the hands of women is the best way for communities to build the future that they want um, and the best way to lift communities out of poverty. Um, women know what their families need um, and they invest in their homes and in their families and in their communities when they have the means to do so. And that's something that we've seen again and again, not just here, but that's you know all over the world. Um, uh, here is another photo of our, of our artisans. Um, um, back to Graciela a little bit to illustrate this story. So um, between her skill weaving and her work in tourism, Graciela was a great earner with us. For years, she put her husband through high school and he graduated. And now she does not work with us as much anymore um, because he found work and they started building their house and they decided to have another baby. Um, and then a few years later, they had another baby, both girls. Um, so uh, their son now has two little sisters who are in this picture here. This is Graciela and Asunta and Graciela's two daughters. Um, they live in their own, ho own house now and her husband works in a nearby town and she weaves still for us, but not as, not as much as before and takes, takes care of their kids. Um, and uh, which is, uh, I think a, a really, you know, even though she's not weaving as much with us anymore, it's, it's because she's decided to do other things and she can do other things, which, um, which is wonderful. Um, this is another one of our families and some of the families, like I mentioned, we see the men working less and helping their, their wives with tourism or with weaving or spinning or different parts of the weaving process. Um, we have one family where the mother is using her income from Awamaki to send her six, to save up and try to put her six daughters through school. This is the oldest daughter, Felicitas, um, and she just graduated from technical school in tourism. Um, and her goal is to, which is a huge deal. I mean, very few girls from this community even graduate from high school. Um, and so, you know, this is a big achievement. And she, uh, her goal is to move back to, to Patacancha and to start a tourism business. Um, so these are the changes that we see being made when you put, uh, when you put income in the hands of women and we're gonna try to keep doing that for as long as we can. Um, as soon as, as soon as COVID is, magically solved um and I can talk a little bit more about what you know what that looks like right now but yeah that's it thank you so much for that lecture Kennedy that was amazing it was really incredible to learn about life in the Quechua villages with you all and what um, Awamaki is doing to empower rural women women artisans uh, we do have a lot of questions and if anybody wants to submit questions you still can um, just do so through the zoom Q&A or through the Facebook live uh, live stream comment section um, but since we have so many I'm just going to go ahead and jump into it um, 
first question we have is what has life been like um, in the traditional Andean villages during the pandemic? And also what has been, you know, kind of your response to the pandemic as well as an organization? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Man, so all these changes, all of this, um, I, I would call it progress. I don't think everybody would, but um, I certainly would. And um, over the past few years and, and it's the pandemic, it was like a generation going backwards a generation overnight. I mean, it was like all of a sudden there was a road, but there was no transportation and you weren't allowed to, you know, go any, go on the road um, to go anywhere. Um, there, you know, all of the income that the families were earning from tourism, not just the artisans with our program, but their husbands all worked in tourism too, just, just completely disappeared overnight. Um, it was like, they were plunged backwards 40 years into subsistence agriculture. Um, and, uh, and it made, you know, the things that they had, that many of the older adults had been raised doing, but really saw a different future for their kids. Kids weren't in school. That was another really big thing that like all of these women had worked so hard to either go to school or get their kids into school. And, and many of them did not have an edu do not have an education and all of a sudden their kids aren't in school. There's, they're stuck in the community. There's no, there's no like cash money and they, um, you know, and they are relying on, on crops that they planted for, for supplementary food, you know, that um, not even that they planted thinking that this was something that they were gonna need to survive on. And so um, it was really hard uh, and really scary for them. Uh, and we, you know, we, one of the things that we did as an organization we do, we, you know, we do a lot of evaluating the impact of our work. And one of the things that we find um, is that the artisans spend their money from, uh, from our programs on food and on education. Those are the two main things that they buy. And so, and so we, we kicked into gear with food relief um, and started fundraising to provide um, 160 artisans with food baskets, monthly food baskets, which we've been able to do now for nine months. Um, actually 10 months, I guess, February. Um, and so, uh, and that has just been thanks entirely to donors. You know, as it were a small nonprofit, we did not have the means to just feed 160 families for 10 months. Um, and so that has been totally funded by, um, by people who have visited Peru, by people who, um, yeah, mostly by people who visit the Peru and are paying attention to how hard things are there. Um, and uh, yeah, and so uh, that's something I'm, I'm really proud of and is really different than what we usually do. We usually focus on, you know, a hand up rather than a handout. That's kind of um, where we, where our strength is, but um, you know, there's definitely a time for, uh, for material, actual tangible material support and that is now. And so, yeah, that's what we've been doing. Definitely. That's amazing. I'm so glad that you guys have been able to continue to support these communities, even in such hard times and that, you know, so many people have been willing also to contribute and, and are paying attention to how difficult this can be, you know, especially like it's hard for everyone. So if it's hard for you, imagine how hard it is for someone in a rural community, you know, in the in the high in the Andes Mountains. So I think that's amazing. I, I will quickly leave. Um, they have a GoFundMe and I will quickly leave that. Thank um, you. The, the link in the chat, if anybody would like to check that out. Um, before we move on to our next questions, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind to stop sharing your screen quickly. Oh um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no problem, no worries at all. Um, our next question uh, is, they would just like, Lynn would like to know if you have a connection with the Center for Traditional Textiles. Yeah, actually Nilda was um, helped. So our predecessor project, which the name was CATCO, um, their founder helped them get started. Um, and they really were emulating her work, which has been emulated by dozens of projects all over the Cusco region. I mean, they're, they're fabulous. So we don't have like, a, you know, we don't regularly work with them or anything, but we're certainly admirers and, um, and have shared spaces with them before, for sure, and collaborated with them, which is always an immense honor. I mean, they're wonderful. That's great. That's great. I'm so glad to hear it. Um, what are some What are some of the most obvious changes in the communities of the rural Andes that you've seen over the time that you've been there? The houses. I mean, the houses. It used to be like adobe, like adobe or stone houses, and were thatched. And um, 
even just since I've been there, it looks like Oyante Chambo in a lot of places now. Like not only are the two story houses now, but they're also, um, you know, they're like plastering and painting the outside, which is not something that they used to do because they would make, you know, the outside was like a mud. Um, yeah, it's, I would say that that's the major thing. And then to some extent the dress, although that hasn't, you know, that, that change has more been with children and men, like used to see men in ponchos and the bayeta pants a lot more. And now they've, they, the men are almost, unless it's a festival or they're really, really cold and need a poncho, you know, it's the men are almost entirely in Western dress now. Um, yeah, those are just really visible things. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Jan would like to know where the women get the chemical dyes for the bright colors, particularly if they don't have any money. Um, yeah, you can buy those at market. So, um, and they're pretty cheap. So, you know, they, this is, and, and this is something that the communities where we work because of their proximity to Ayante Tambo have been using chemical dyes for a very long time, like 60 years. Um, whereas villages that are further away um, and, and haven't, you know, even just a further walk from the nearest market have a much stronger natural dyes tradition. So the natural dyes that we do, we've had to really intentionally kind of bring back and build on knowledge that, like a much more limited knowledge base that's there. Um, and, and the way we've done that is actually by bringing people from more remote villages that, that still have a stronger natural dye tradition. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, Jan also says that the woven patterns are very intricate. Do the women know them by heart? Yes. The designs they definitely know by heart and they also make them up as they go along so it's kind of like if you think of like a grid in your mind like a piece of graph paper and each kind of pixel has to be a color right when they plan out their whole you know they have that image in their head when they set up the loom because it's um because all of the colors are the vertical structure of the of the loom and so then they're choosing you know which colors are are on top essentially of the weft of the um of the horizontal thread that that um that goes i'm getting it yeah anyways um so so both um you know they a lot of the designs you see again and again and actually some of the designs you can go to museums and see five thousand year old textiles with the same design um and a lot of them they just they just make up as they go along, but they have that in their head and they have it kind of planned out, um, even though they, they um, you know, have maybe have never been to school. It's like, a, it's like a piece of graph paper and a whole design in their head. It's pretty spectacular actually, and really hard to do. Yes, yeah, seriously, that sounds incredibly impressive. I mean, I have a hard enough time just knitting a regular, you know, scarf, let alone with these intricate designs. They're so beautiful. Um, and also, Mike says the blankets are beautiful. Are they expensive? Yes. Um, yeah, they take a lot of work. Um, I would say those, something like that, like the one that the women, the yike that the women were holding up. Um, gosh, if you were to buy it from them on a tour would probably be upwards of, well, it depends on your definition of expensive, I guess, like maybe 250 to $300. It's um, not cheap. Yeah. I mean, no. definitely, <laughs> definitely worth that much. That is for sure. Right. <laughs> it's so, not more. Yeah. So how much yeah. do you get paid for two weeks of work? Right. So, <laughs> right. Um, depends on your definition of expensive, I guess. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, someone would like to know more about the hats and if uh, they have any particular meaning. Yeah, so those hats, the hats that the women were wearing in the photos were called Mondera hats. Um, and you can see like in the picture of Asunta, they'll fill them with like flowers for a special occasion. Um, they also often will decorate them by sewing. They're bought in the market. They don't make them, but they'll decorate them by, by putting like safety pins or sewing sequins onto them or beads. Um, and they also the hat straps um, are beaded, which they're woven, and then they they bead not just the edge of the strap, but like the entire strap is is beaded. Um, and that is, those are actually really expensive if you try to buy those. But that's a ton of work. Um, and those have designs, um, so they they do have a lot of significance in the way that the women design them or how they decorate them. But the hats themselves, like with the turned up, are just they're not even the women will even tell you they're not even very functional. If anything, the main function is as a purse. They have like a little pocket in them where you can stick your money when you go to the market. But 
they don't like shield the sun or the rain or anything like that. Like they're turned up and the women will totally tell you that. <laughs> then, um, and this is not my, my experience wearing it. This is what they, what they say about it. Um, and the hats are different everywhere. I think Peru has like 4,000 types of typical hats that are worn in different places or something crazy like that. Um, so they're very specific to the valley where we work. And even just like one valley over, you know, a six hour hike away, they're wearing a different kind of, slightly different kind of hat. And then again, the, you know, the valley over. That's really interesting. Um, Michael would like to know how much are traditional weavings used in everyday life in Andean villages? Um, you know, not as much anymore. I would say the main the main use is um, the yikya, which is that uh, that big square that they'll fold and then tie across their shoulders for warmth, um, or the poncho for the men, um, which you know again is for warmth, but. Uh, but a lot, I would say most of the weaving that they do now is for tourism. Um, but that's not, you know, that's not to say they're not, they're not using it. They're just, um, it's just, they're not, most of what they produce is for sale. Um, they'll also use, like, they will, um, there's a, there's a woven pouch that they'll, that the men actually will carry a lot. So that's, a, that's actually something that you see a lot. The, the pouches that the men carry, those are woven. Um, uh, and then, and then some of like the saddle blankets are woven, but most, you know, most of, for some, depending on the community and, and how close it is and how much earned income they have, um, they're buying a lot of those things because, because they can make weavings and sell them and then buy what they want. Exactly. <laughs> That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, another question we have is also about the textiles, um, but this one is about the skirts. Do they make their own skirts? They are really interesting. Yeah, they, um, the, the bottom, they don't make the whole skirt, but the bottom strip is woven and they do make that. And that is actually a different kind of loom um, that they used for that. That's, that's really great. It's, it's so interesting to learn about all the different kinds of weavings and techniques that they have. It's super fascinating and very distinct and diverse um, for, for this part of the world and, and also very ancient as well, as you've mentioned before. Um, another question that we have is um, from Tom on Facebook is if any pre-Incan designs or motifs are encouraged in the weavings, like, such as from the Wari culture. I can't say I know very much or actually anything about the Wari culture, but um, but I will say that yes, you know, if you look at um, uh, you know some of the like the Garcilaso de la Vega images, drawings of weavings, or if you you know if you go to a museum in Lima and you can see really old weavings, a lot of those designs you still see, um, and a lot of them are very typical, like you you know the Andean cross. Um, or the kocha, the lake design, um, you can you can definitely see in you know very very old. Wow, that's great. That's it's great to know that these traditions are still being passed down. Um, they are, but then you also get like girls who have been to school who are weaving like words into in Spanish into their yeah. weave, and so it's definitely a living you know a living thing that they're still using to communicate. Exactly, their culture is very much alive and changing. You know, as as all of our cultures are, and it's it's great to see. The, the influence of both, you know, previous times and the modern times. And, and I'm glad that you guys are there also as well, like supporting, supporting the, not only just the preserv preservation of culture, but, you know, empowering women and communities to make sure that preservation of culture isn't, you know, taken over, like seen as a higher priority as, you know, their actual livelihoods. So that's great. Um, another question we have is about, um, Let's see. Um, does anyone work with vicuña fibers? Yeah. <laughs> not where we are. <laughs> I you you I don't even I don't think it's even legal to sell vicuña fibers. I might be wrong about that. Vicuña are very strongly protected, though. It's true. Um, what does awamaki mean? That's a great question. Awamaki means hand woven. Um, and we, awa is loom and maki is hands. And so we have just kind of taken out the cue um, to make it a little bit more um, accessible to different, different pronunciation abilities. 
That's great. Very appropriately named. <laughs> um, so what uh, Tom would like to know what land ownership is like in the villages, if you know anything about that. Oh, man, that's a good question. <laughs> um, really interesting. So after the agricultural reform in, I think, the 50s, um, maybe the 60s, oh, 1968, I think, they, um, they took big haciendas and they entrusted them to community, like community organizations, like the community with a capital C, you know, it's, um, it's like a, it's like an, a type of government um, and made up of landowners. And so that's how, um, that's how the land is owned and administered in these, in these communities. So um, it's, it's kind of governed by, by anybody who's a landowner owner can go to these meetings and be part of the community. And then they decide kind of who can use the land and how. And so land can be, you know, passed down um, and used, but if you don't use it for a long time, then it can be, the community will take it back and give it to somebody else. Um, you can also build a house on it for yourself to live, but either you can't or you need permission to build like a hotel that you're gonna make money off of. Um, you, uh, yeah, so you're, you're, so there's a lot of like, and then the longer you're part of the community, you sort of move up and you can get better and better land. But like, if you were living in Peru, you could go join the community and ask for a piece of land and they would just give you like a really terrible one probably, but you, you know, you can do that just as somebody who lives there. I don't know. You might have to like be a resident or something. <laughs> you guys might not be able to do that, but, um, uh, yeah, and so it's it's um it's very uh it's very um communitarian uh which aligns with the cultural values um in in the communities um it's not all the land there is land that's like privately owned outright and the community can actually sell land but you can't sell your land if you are given it to, given it by the community the community sells it and then they earn the money from that so um. Yeah, it's really interesting and it is really a minefield if you're looking to like develop or build something in Peru. Yeah, I can imagine that sounds quite complicated, but also very interesting. <laughs> well, I'll just continue with the questions because we still have a few and we are running out of time. Um, so Dina would like to know where are, are the villages that you work with and how can we visit them in the future? They're um, about an hour to two hours outside of Oriente Tambo and you can go to our website and book a tour at any time and we are giving we are, if you want to just, you just think you might be in Peru, you want to book a tour, that's fine. If you can't come, we'll give you a refund. <laughs> um, we're very flexible right now. We'd love to have anybody come and visit as soon as, uh, as soon as it's safe. Definitely, yes. And both Proof for Less and Inca Expert, they also organize complete packages and are happy to include tours with Aomaki in them. So anybody who's willing to, wanting to come to Peru, you know, feel free to reach out to either one of us. Um, and, and make it happen because it's truly a special place and you won't regret it. <laughs> but of course, when it's safe, we do have to wait um, <laughs> a little bit longer. Um, that's definitely, I feel like something that you guys have done a really good job of as well is, you know, you really listen to the communities and, and haven't been accepting any tourism at all, right? Uh, are the communities still closed? Um, they were open briefly and now they're closed again. So it's kind of comes and goes. Um, what we are doing with them um, is accepting, you know, mostly there's not really international tourists, but if somebody does want a tour who's maybe living in Peru, um, we are paying for the artisan's transport, private transport down to our office, which is open air. So rather than send people to the villages, which, you know, don't have health clinics and access to healthcare and you know would we really really want to um not be said we don't want to be sending people um from from outside there uh yeah. and we can do you know we're doing tours like in our in our office or we're offering that for people who are kind of looking to spring or summer we're getting a little bit of inquiry so that's kind of where we are i think some people are going to the villages but we are not ready to do that yet and that's what we've heard that's great. Yeah, I think that's a smart decision. Um, let's see, I'll just continue with the questions. Um, let's see, Suzanne says, does the increased income that the women are realizing uh, enable the women to qualify for loans from banks or from the government, um, like through via Mi Vivienda or other social programs to buy and improve their homes? Or are all the purchases slash improvements still just made the, via the informal market, uh, aka cash? Mm -hmm. Um, no, there are definitely some, sorry, my five-year-old was screaming, so I didn't hear all of that, but 
Um, there are definitely some programs that the artisans are taking advantage of. Like um, recently there was a municipal program that built bathrooms um, in all the houses, like modern bathrooms. Um, so there are definitely some of that. I don't know the details about like what government programs they are. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'm glad they do have access to that though. Um, Edgar on Facebook uh, would like to know what the perception of communities have about the pandemic and what kind um, of things they have done uh, to made in relationships with, or like, how are they careful with um, the people who come to visit them, I guess? Mm -hmm. they, for, they have been outright closed for a lot of it. I mean, and yeah. this is one thing about the, the communities is they, they even like in, not in a pandemic, what you know they'll like like if they're mad at about like a municipal project or something they will like close the road um and this is what i was talking about a little bit before like they're very wary of outsiders they're it's very insular like we we have worked there for year you know 12 years we have staff who speak quechua like we are seeing them every week and they still view us as like total outsiders like you know we'll find out that there's like if something they're not telling us or just it's just it's very um it's very insular and very wary of, of outsiders and so um this has really they have really drawn on that and and they were just like no one you know no one's allowed in for a long time um uh they also uh, i think in terms of how they feel about it i think they have felt really scared i mean they um you know they're getting information on the radio which is news you know they're, they're they're paying attention they know what's going on um but they're not uh they don't have like cleaning supplies and soap and much less like access to a health clinic i mean cusco or Urubamba, where they're treating covid patients is like you know out like if there's no transportation that's like a toyanta that's like at least a four hours walk from one of our villages it's like a 13 hour walk you know and so there's just um you know, if they get sick, like that's, it's, um, uh, there's not a lot of resources that they have to, to draw on. So, um, so I think they've been really scared and, um, and felt really alone, like just in that kind of all the tourism and all of the, everything just kind of disappeared over, just vanished overnight. And so, um, you know, and, and all of the kind of stability and prosperity that they built went with it. Um, and just the fact that that could happen I think is, is really isolating. Definitely, it's definitely very difficult, and I'm hoping this this time passes quickly, and you know, and we don't have to think about these things happening again. Even though I know that's <laughs> that's definitely possible, but I know we're all ready for for us to move past the pandemic, and, and hopefully that tourism will be safe again in the future soon. Um, Edgar would also like to know if you were able to learn some Quechua while you lived in Peru, and do you think that the native language is really difficult to learn? Also, he says thank you for the lecture. Yeah. Oh, it's incredibly difficult to learn. I mean, it is the, the, you know, I, so I, I speak English and Spanish and there's really some, you know, just in sort of sentence structure, there are some similarities, you know, you have like a noun and a verb and they might not be in the same places, but you have that in Quechua, but it's like, they like put it all in the same word, you know? And so it's, it's, um, and then the word changes, the tense of the word changes depending on, and it's been a really long time since I studied Quechua, so I might mess this up. Um, but you know, it changes depending on whether it's like your your brother or your sister speaking, or that or that you're speaking about. Um, you know, there's like there's like a we that includes you, and there's a we that doesn't include you, and there you know there's a whole um, it's it's just grammatically totally different um, and really really difficult to learn. Um, and the pronunciation, you know, they have like three letters that are the k sound, and we have one, and so it's sort of completely changes your meaning um I did study Quechua as you can tell and I was I was like able to have a conversation by the end of most of my time in Peru and that has completely evaporated like that was the first thing to go my Spanish is still pretty strong but like I, you know I can basically say like what's your name my name is Kennedy um that's great. <laughs> well, I'm glad you still have that at least. Yeah, definitely. If you're not practicing it, language, it goes quickly. <laughs> and especially a language that's very difficult. And, you know, you're not going to find anyone probably close to you in Seattle that's <laughs> speaking it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> 
Well, uh, we do have some more questions, so I'm just going to keep powering through them because um, we just have a few more to go, and I would like to get to everyone. Uh, Jan would like to know if the ponchos, rugs, etc., are made just of alpaca wool, or do they have sheep or other animals? Mostly sheep. Most of what the artisans weave are sheep is sheep wool. Um, they do definitely use alpaca, um, but they mostly sell the alpaca that they have. Um, and everything that we make uh, with weaving is is sheep. We also work with knitters and they work with alpaca, um, but that we buy already, for the most part, buy already processed um, and, and spun and dyed um, commercially because that's it's very hard to get the kind of loft that you need for knitting without the commercial um, you know, equipment and cleaning. Um, yeah. Interesting, thank you. Um, Jan would also like to know if there is any similarity between Quechua and Spanish. Well, yes, in that there's a lot of words that cross over both ways in Peru, um, but, uh, you know, not foundationally, no, because, um, because they developed completely differently, obviously, but, you know, just sort of for the vocabulary there is and things like numbers, you know, or people, there are ways to say the numbers in Quechua, but people use the numbers in Spanish, same for months, days of the week, and stuff like that. But um, yeah, but you can't get by with Spanish if somebody's not, it's not close enough that you can get by with Spanish if someone's speaking Quechua. Definitely. <laughs> Unless they're just um, like counting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. Uh, Tommy Wood, he says that one of the first photos with the llamas looked like it was in the Caros um, region. Do you all plan to expand into the Comunidades Campesinas there as well? Um, we don't have any plans to expand right now. Our plan right now is to get back to work. Um, at, before this, we were working with, um, we were looking to expand a little bit and um, we had started working with artisans in, oh, uh, near Asongate, in Okungate. Um, and really that was driven by uh, the artisans that near Oyakutambo are really more interested in tourism than in cre you know, creating products for sale and export because uh, they can make a lot more with tourism. And so, you know, we were looking for communities that did not have a strong tourism market and, and were more interested in, and also just kind of in terms of opportunity, um, had a stronger need for opportunity in, in craft sales. That's really interesting. Yeah, well, hopefully we will, <laughs> things will get back on track and we can continue doing the great work that you guys are doing. Um, we have just a few more questions. Dina says that she's seen um, backstrap weaving in Guatemala in the rural areas. And she's wondering if these women sit on the ground or a stool when they weave um, and can they weave on both sides of the material? Um, they, they sit on the ground mostly. Um, both sides of the material, I think you mean like from both ends um, and they don't really do that. Um, I think that they could, and actually that's how they, I think that might be how they do the quattro stacas, the design I was talking about, that's a little bit more complicated, but um, but no, for the most part, they just weave from one side up. That's really interesting. Um, I guess so the, one of our last questions is, um, one moment, is, Oh yes, um, what is the symbolism of the Greek key in the traditional weavings of Padakancha? I don't know what the Greek key is. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right, no worries. I Google that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Elizabeth says that she's glad to hear that the school visit paradigm is lessening because it is problematic. Are there any local laws in place that are starting to prevent school visits on a policy level? No, I wish. No, it's really, um, it's actually more been, I think, the awareness of on agencies and like from tourists themselves that this is inappropriate. I mean, there's been a lot more, even just since I've been living in Peru, there's a lot more awareness about sustainable tourism and the impact of tourists. Um, and I think school visits have been like at the top of the list for, um, for a lot of people who are starting to realize that. But um, uh, but no, I, I mean, I think if tourists showed up to school, they would still let them visit. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know about that. That, that might not be right. 
Yeah, well, at least look, luckily, like culturally, it is changing, um, you know, with Absolutely. even like Americans as well, like realizing that it's not really the right thing to do. Um, and that there are other ways, you know, that they can support these communities if they would like to do that. Um, mm -hmm. um, let's see, one of the last questions is, um, let's see, actually, now I think all of the questions are done, but I do have some comments from some people that I'd like to share. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth says that she has to leave, but she thanks you very much for this lecture. She learned a lot and it was great to get an update on how Aomaki is doing. Oh, good. And um, let's see, someone mentioned that they have the Inti um little wallet thing oh um, yeah the wristlet yeah elizabeth oh, says good. also that she has that <laughs> um and also lynn says that they love peru and has since they were nine years old got to live there in high school and still have con connections and they wow. were very excited to see what you were doing wow that's amazing all right well i think that is everything so thank you all so much for joining us today thank you everyone for your wonderful questions and thank you kennedy for taking the time to answer them and share some knowledge on everything that's happening not pre-pandemic and also right now what's happening during the pandemic as well and you know we wish you nothing but the best moving forward and um you know we hope that everyone you know listening today does make it down to peru someday in the future and that you're interested in doing a tour with aomaki you know feel free to reach out to aomaki peru for lesser expert travel and we would all love to make that happen for you thanks again kennedy have a great rest of your evening thank you guys so much all right thank you everyone i hope you all enjoyed this lecture please be on the lookout for more lectures from us in the future and um, you know please feel free to um, re-watch this it will be on our facebook pages on both the inca expert facebook page and on the proof for less facebook page and thanks again for joining and we hope you'll have a great evening mm -hmm.